One of the biggest struggles of living in a bus is maintaining a cool, comfortable climate indoors. And there's no easier way to do that than by using a solar powered mini split. So today, I'm happy to show you in partnership with Pioneer just how to do that by yourself without hiring a professional and get the job done on your school bus. My name's Chuck Cassidy. Thanks for tuning in on this episode. I'm very excited to show you, uh -oh. along with my friend <laughs> Brock Butterfield from Bus Life Adventure. That's right. So this is my bus and we are gonna have Charlie help us put a deckless mini split in today from Pioneer. Yes, and this is the Diamante Ultra 12,000 BTU, 124 volt unit, 420 volt I guess is really. Who's counting the volts, baby? As long as I stay cool, I don't care how many <laughs> volts are going through that thing. We're going to be putting a mini split on this bus, and we can't wait to show you how it's done mostly the right way. So it's going to be a good time. Yeah, and a few reasons why I wanted a mini split. Um, traveling with kids and animals, we want to make sure we have a good climate. And uh, after talking to Charlie about some options for cooling, he sold me on the mini split idea and then we happened to be talking to Pioneer at the same time and said, hey, let's put a video together of an install. Let's have Charlie come out and help with it. So here we are. Here are we you are. ready to get hot and dirty before it cools <laughs> down? I am ready to get hot and dirty before it cools down. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started talking mini splits. We've talked about why we decided to use a mini split for this bus for air conditioning and heating. Now I want to tell you why we chose this mini split in particular. Now Pioneer is a company that we've been working with in my shop for the last four years since we started installing mini splits. And frankly, they're the only mini split that we recommend and that we install in our shop. And I say that because they have an excellent track record. We've had no issues to date with any of our units. Um, and in addition to that, they make a mini split that offers a great combination of efficiency and value. And because all of their systems are DIY friendly, it's something the average person like you or me could do in your backyard, which is what we're doing today, and get great results without breaking the bank or having to track down a local HVAC technician to come and install it for you. The unit we have here today is a new model from Pioneer. It's their Diamante Ultra. And don't let the exotic name fool you, it's still very reasonably priced. I think we can get this unit retailing for under $1,000 or right around that price point depending on where you buy it. Um, this unit in particular, it's a 12,000 BTU model, um, which is the highest BTU rated model that they offer in a 120 volt configuration. We do the 120 volt configuration because that matches up with the inverter that's in Brock's bus. It's a 120 volt AC inverter, a Victron unit. So we've got the rating here. It's called a SEER rating. Um, 22 SEER is getting up into the high end of things. You know, you can spend four times as much and get into the 30s, um, which is great if you have the budget, but let's be honest, um, you know, spending $4,000 on your mini split is something most people aren't gonna do. 22 Sears is a great combination. If you think of a typical window mount AC unit, that's usually gonna be in the 12 Sear range. And it does scale linearly. So this is almost twice as efficient in terms of electricity in and cooling out that you would see if you were doing a conventional window unit, like from a house or something. So this is their highest Sear rated model, the highest output you can get at 120 volts. And that's what we're going for on this bus because we want as much cooling as we can get with as little electricity as we can put in and reasonably afford. Okay, let's take a look at what's included in the boxes from Pioneer. Now, when you get your delivery, it will arrive on a pallet. Um, they do ship via freight. So it'll be a big truck, but they're not really ridiculously heavy. Two people can easily unload the pallet if need be. Oh, and isn't this nice? So this is a one-to-one -one scale drawing of not only the mounting bracket, which is this, which you see here, but also the overall size of the unit. Moving on to the inside, if you're not familiar with other Pioneer units, this probably doesn't look like anything special, but looking at this right now, I can tell that they've actually changed the design of this unit. 
it looks, I actually like this design. It's a little cleaner and it's uh, not quite as rounded. One of the things I really like about the Pioneer Mini Splits is that they are designed to be installed by people like you and me. They're DIY friendly. And because of that, they include everything that you need on the hardware side of things to make the installation happen. So when you order your Mini Split from Pioneer, you'll have the option to select the line set. And the line set that they're talking about is what connects the indoor section to the outdoor section. And it's comprised of a set of wires and these copper lines that carry the refrigerant to and from, which live in these insulated sheaths. Now you'll want to measure and figure out what your distance is going to be. For us, our distance is very short, but you can order line sets as long as 25 feet before you have to then start adding additional refrigerant. And at that point, you will need to call an HVAC professional. So definitely, if you can, when you're designing your bus and getting your layout, try to keep your indoor and outdoor units within 25 feet so you don't have to buy a bigger custom line set and then hire somebody to come charge your system for you. So included in the box, we've got our line set. We've got our line set uh, installation, I guess, accessories. This includes the uh, kind of like trim garnish ring for the outdoor section that we'll run our line sets through. And then to seal that up, there's some plasticine as well as the drain tube for draining the condensation out of the indoor unit. Stuff that you will need to buy either on your own or also from Pioneer to complete your install. The first one is going to be a gauge set. You can buy these all over the place at automotive stores. A lot of hardware stores offer them. Pioneer also sells one. This measures the pressure of the refrigerant in the unit. We'll be using this to check for leaks when we pull a vacuum and also to make sure that as we start adding the refrigerant back in that we don't have any leaks, uh, leaks in it once we start to pressurize it. The other thing you're going to need to buy is a tube flaring kit. This is for if you, like us, will need to cut your line set down to a custom length and most people will. Uh, we'll show you in detail how to use this, but this is a really affordable set. This particular one also comes with a cutter which is nice because you'll need the tool to cut the pipe. And if you're gonna be doing any tight bends, uh, it comes with these little spring pipe bender to help you uh, bend it without kinking the lines. Obviously a kink in the lines is gonna be a big problem for you. The last tool that you'll need aside from just basic hand tools is a vacuum pump. A unit like this is under $60. Those are the things that you'll need to buy. Of course, you're gonna want a whole plethora of hand tools. You're gonna to need to, at the very least, a drill, a screw gun, you know, measuring tape, all the things that you should probably already have if you're doing a bus conversion. The most difficult part of the installation process, at least in my view, is finding a location and mounting the outdoor exterior unit. It needs to be mounted according to the outdoor installation location selection guidelines shown in the manual. The most important thing for this is that it needs to have really good airflow. And because of that, we're going to be doing our best to follow the guidelines they give for the clearances uh, on the sides and the back of this unit. So as it says in the manual, they want 12 inches back here. And then they also want uh, 20 inches on either side. Well, the sides aren't an issue, but how far we hang it off the back is. Now, luckily for us, the roof of the bus actually ends right about here. So although it is asking for 12 inches, we're probably gonna end up closer to eight because we just, we don't wanna have it hanging that far off the bus, but I think we'll be fine because it's not a full back wall there. It's not like a conventional brick wall on a house or anything like that. And I feel very confident that this unit's gonna get plenty of airflow. Now, this might be more of an issue for somebody who is mounting this unit under the bus. And that's something we've done a lot at my shop. And if you're doing that, you're gonna to have to use your own judgment, but ultimately you wanna make sure that at every turn, you're doing everything you can to maximize airflow out of the unit. Additionally, if it's gonna be mounted under the bus, you wanna make sure that it's well clear of any hot exhaust lines or anything related to the engine that might be adding heat to this unit. Because this unit's job is most of the time going to be to pump heat out of the bus, you don't wanna be making its life any harder. That's gonna reduce its efficiency and its effectiveness for you. The other place where I've often seen these mounted is on the back bumper of a bus. People will extend it, have a back deck or something, and that's a great place to mount it. You just wanna make sure that you're following the mounting guidelines. For us, 
it's going to be living up above the back door on Brock's bus and that's probably from a performance standpoint one of the more efficient places that you could put it because the airflow is going to be so good there and because it's up and out of the way of road debris and dust which could potentially get into the fins on the core of this unit and cause it to again have reduced efficiency so that's why we're putting it up above the door and it's a very important part and probably the hardest part about doing this whole install we're going to go ahead and get started welding up the bracket that's going to carry this Hopefully get this thing hung up here soon. sun's dipping low in the sky and that's fine because this guy is done welding up our bracket that will hold the exterior unit of the mini split um, you can see our design came to life one thing I didn't have in my drawing was there needs to be an extra runner here to catch the back mount of the mini split but if you got the guts to weld this up I'm sure you would have figured that out on your own one thing I'll point out to you though when you do this diagonal piece underneath this cover this is where we hook up the line set. So this cover will come off and there's some nuts that we're gonna have to tighten, some valves that we're gonna have to operate. And you don't want this bogarting your access to this assembly here. So just a little pro tip for you. But uh, I think we're gonna go pick up some paint, get a coat on this so that it's ready for tomorrow and then we'll pick things up in the morning and actually start installing some of this. See you then. Welcome back to day two on our Pioneer Mini Split install in Brock's backyard. And today we're gonna to get started by determining the location of our indoor unit and getting ready to mount and install the bracket, run our line set, and basically prepare ourselves for the installation of the rest of the Mini Split hardware. The first thing we have to do is take a look at our instructions. The first part we wanna look at are the indoor unit installation location selection guidelines. So we've got a lot of do nots and a lot of do's. Um, the gist of this here though, is we wanna make sure that we're maintaining clearances on the left and right of the unit, as well as above it for optimum airflow. We also want to make sure that our holes where we run the refrigerant and electrical connections to the outdoor unit are located in the correct spots. Um, we also want to make sure that our substrate that we're attaching this to can handle the load and furthermore, make sure that if we need to service this, which you will, there's filters and some elements in here that you need to clean periodically, that it's easy to service and that you can get to it. We're going to start by taking our template, kindly provided to us by Pioneer, going inside and putting this right where we want it. We're going to mark our hole locations and then we'll pull this down. We'll put our holes in. One difference will be we're gonna actually cut a big hole in the wall here so that we can get into the wall cavity for bolting our mounting bracket for the outdoor unit on. And then we'll remove the bracket from the back of this, which you can't see now, but the bracket's already attached. We'll go ahead and remove the bracket, install it on the back wall. And at that point, we're gonna be ready to start running our line sets and actually mounting the units. You know, as always, working in a school bus, nothing's ever square, nothing's ever straight. So at the end of the day, you kind of just have to trust your peepers to know <laughs> the, right, the right orientation for things. We're looking for maximum efficiency right here. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so come back in here. What I did before we, uh, put this up on the wall, I took my pen and actually poked through the cardboard at all of the screw hole locations. And then I also poked through some dots where we're going to be cutting out our access panel. We're going to be sticking basically our entire arms in through this to get to the nuts on the back of our mounting plate. So or our man mounting bracket, but we'll just mark all these holes.
So we didn't know what we we're gonna get into when we cut this open, and when we got in here, the wires, that's not such a big deal, but actually having these two by fours in here, it's gonna get right in the way of where our main refrigerant line hole is. We're gonna to have to actually go through all these two by fours and get into this cavity. And in addition to that, we have to run our drain line out here. So realizing that these are gonna be in the way for all of that work, we've decided that the best move is actually to remove this panel. Um, it's gonna be a little bit of extra work, but it's gonna let us get in here and do the work that we need to do a lot more cleanly. It's the afternoon of day two on our install. We spent the first half of the day preparing the inside for the in, uh, indoor installation. And now the sun's put us in the shadow. We're gonna go ahead and take this bracket that we welded up and painted yesterday and attach it to the pre-drilled holes up on the bus, up above the back door. Once the bracket's in place, we'll set this unit on top of it, put the rubber gaskets down, bolt it down, and then we can go ahead and begin doing the electrical and refrigerant plumbing to and from this unit. Now that we have the exterior unit of our mini split system mounted, we can go ahead and start getting ready to make our connections for electrical and refrigerant. What we're going to start with um, is installing this outdoor junction box that's going to go right up there where that hole is drilled. And this will be how we manage the pass through of the electrical wires from the interior of the bus to the outside of the bus. Once they enter into the junction box, we're going to use some liquid tight flexible conduit which will run out of the bottom of this, and there'll be two, two lengths of that, one carrying the power to the unit and then the other carrying the power and control lines from this unit to the indoor unit. This is a great way to do it. A lot of people get confused on this step, so go to your local home improvement store, pick up an outdoor rated enclosure and some liquid type flexible conduit, and you'll be set. We're using half inch because that is what the unit is pre-drilled for, and it's ready to accept if you look up in those little holes up there these liquid tight fittings. We'll be removing that cover and we'll also be removing the lower cover and that's gonna expose the connection points for our refrigerant lines. Once we have that off, I'm gonna eyeball what looks like the straightest route out exiting those valves and into the bus, mark that location and go ahead and making a two and a half inch hole using a two and a half inch hole saw. And that hole will accept this trim ring and there's also another tube that goes through there to protect the lines as they pass through into the bus. And we will seal all of these penetrations up, both the electrical and the refrigerant lines with uh, your favorite flavor of sealant. In our case, we're using Sikaflex, 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 however you want to pronounce it. There is our electrical pass through. That's the hole I just drilled. So this piece here is gonna go right over that just like that. And that's gonna be where we run our refrigerant lines out of. And that goes straight through to the inside. When you drill this, you wanna have it sloped downward slightly so that any moisture that maybe lands on the lines doesn't have a chance to fall those lines and run down into this, the living space. My next step is to go ahead and get this glued in and sealed up. And then I think we'll probably get started planning out our refrigerant line runs and getting our electrical components tied in from here to there. We're assembling our liquid tight fittings here. And what I like to do is take this cover off, go ahead and put our uh, end fittings on. And then we're just gonna put this back on here temporarily so that we can go ahead and pre-cut and size our liquid tight lines. And we'll go ahead and we'll cut our next one to length here. And then I like to take this off, go ahead and run our wires through, through the, the lines, have them come out the end, hook everything up, and then screw this back on. We're using 12 gauge wire out to the unit because 
They spec the minimum ampacity for the circuit at 17 amps, which means that 14 gauge is not going to be enough because it's only 15 amps of uh, ampacity. So we're using 12 gauge, which has 20 amps coming out of our conduit here, and that's going to bring power to the unit. And then we've got our control line here, which will get attached. It's labeled 1, 2, 3 and ground. That'll connect to the 1, 2, 3 and ground terminal here. And we've got our neutral line and then ground screw here. And that's for our power lines. Now, because this is in, a, is in a bus, but in general, it's a good idea, we're gonna be using some heat shrink fittings. And I like these for a lot of reasons, but the main one is that they're waterproof in case any water gets up into here, but also these fittings attach to the wire with a crimp. So we have a really solid mechanical connection that I'm gonna trust a lot more than just sticking a wire up under the clamp and clamping it down. And if you look at what's included with Pioneer, or from Pioneer, it's gonna match what they've done. And we're just gonna maintain that level of quality here. It's so satisfying. We've got all of our connections made, but now's a good time to just double check your work because we wanna make sure that this isn't something we have to worry about later. We've got our power coming in. This is our ground connection. We've got our line connection, which is black. Neutral is the white coming in. Then over here, these are actually already numbered. We've got one, two, and three with the ground that goes to the indoor unit. I use a powered screwdriver to run these in, but I like to do the final torque by hand so that I know exactly where I'm at. If you are trying to really torque these down with a power tool, there's a good chance you could strip it and then you're really in a world of hurt. You don't want a loose connection. Loose connections create resistance. Resistance creates heat. Heat creates fire. Fire leads to suffering. Now that the electrical side is complete, it's time to hook up our refrigerant lines. And I like to always start by hooking the lines up to the outside unit first so that we can go inside, run the lines, and know that we're already hooked up out here and we have plenty of slack. We went ahead and put our lines out through the hole. What you wanna do, wait till the very end before you take these caps off the end of your lines because you don't want any debris or anything getting into them. And then once you have the lines in place, use some of this included sealant here. This is, um, it's like refrigerant leak sealant that you put on the ends of these copper flare fittings. I like to take these down and just one by one what you want to do is make sure that the flare, which you see here, matches up with the sort of conical shaped face on the male fitting. And the manual gives the torque specs on these fittings. It's important that these are a good seal, but you don't want to go too tight on them. Once those connections are made, we are done on the outside until it's time to pull a vacuum and test the system. Welcome back to day three of our mini split install. Um, right now, if you'll notice, we've got our back wall back in place. We went ahead and attached our mounting bracket where we had marked it with the template earlier. Some of the work that we were doing in the walls was getting set up with these connections. And so I rough cut the line set. This line set was way, way long. So I went ahead and cut about six feet off of it just to feed it through the wall. We've got our electrical connection here coming in from the outdoor unit and then we have our drain hose and the drain hose you can see is routed down through here this will get covered up by trim after the fact just some of the extra work you have to do because it's a retrofit done on a previously built bus I would say if you're planning on doing this on a new build it probably knocks off a solid 30 percent of the time involved okay we are rolling cruising right along I want to share with you how I like to measure and pre-cut my line set lengths. So if you look here on the unit, we've got our three plumbing connections to make, our drain and then our two different lines. So these are different lengths and we want these to link up here. Now, because they're copper and they're solid lines, we don't have a lot of flexibility. So we wanna be very precise with our cuts, as precise as we can. The unit itself, once it goes up, it can wiggle left and right a little bit but uh, let's not rely too much on getting that. What I like to do is take my center line on the mini split, which I go ahead and mark, and then I find a center point here on our mounting bracket, and I mark that. There's a lot of marks here, but I know which one it is. And then what I like to do is measure from that center point to the face of the flare connection 
okay? And so right here on the small line, I've got about 14 inches. If you can see here, that's the face. And so then I'll measure 14 inches from my center line and make a mark. And that's what I've got right there is a mark for that 14 inches. I'll do the same for the other line, which I've marked here. And now I know that as I bend these lines around, I can make my cuts at that line, put my flare there. And when we put this up into place, these should line up and go together really easy without too much fuss or putting too much strain on these lines. So we're making our cuts. If you've never used a, uh, a pipe cutter like this before, well, you're gonna have a great time. And I like to go nice and easy. These lines are really soft. And if you tighten the blade down a whole bunch right off the hop, you risk actually just kind of like pinching the end off of your pipe. And that's really not what we're going for here. And then we're actually gonna go in and use the deburring tool that comes with this to clean out any burrs. And when I do this, I actually kind of like to hold the pipe down so that any copper chips or anything spill out onto the floor and don't go into your line set, which then puts it into your, um, your brand new mini split. That's a, that's a real bummer. What we have here is a flare, a flaring tool, I should say. And you'll notice there are a bunch of different sized openings there. Our line set today is a quarter inch and three eighths inch. So we will start by inserting the pipe into our quarter inch hole there. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's like a little bevel on that. We're gonna stick this in so that the end of that pipe is just barely protruding past the surface of the tool itself. With the pipe in and sticking out, we'll then take our tool, oops. And if you notice this tool, it's a wedge. We're gonna stick the tool on there and tighten it down. And as we drive the tool into the flare fitting, it's gonna expand the end of that copper pipe and flare it to match the profile of that taper there. Here's a mistake I've made more than once and boy, it'll make you feel dumb. So when we do a flare connection, we're gonna actually be taking the ends of these copper pipes and flaring them out. Well, before you do that, you gotta get your nuts on there because if you don't and you flare it, well, you're not gonna get your nut on. Okay, so we're all clamped in now. We're gonna come in with our flaring die and tighten that down and just Steady as she goes. And hopefully this all works out. It's always a little exciting. I mean, I've done this enough, but sometimes I surprise myself with a bad flare connection every now and again. And if that happens, again, it's not the end of the world, but you will probably, if you can't save it by either filing off your burrs or, or starting over, then you're gonna have to cut it off. So we've got our line set bent into position with our flared ends set up. And here's a little tip when you're doing this, I will cut a slit in the insulation that the line set comes with. So once we're done with our connection, I'll just put this back in place and maybe put a piece of tape around it. But for now, it's nice to just have it out of the way. We take our indoor unit. And if you look on our bracket, there's some hooks there. And as close to centered as we can, we're gonna take this and just hook it on there. To finish these connections, the way this is designed is you actually can take this, I often use just a roll of tape as a wedge under here, and we'll just wedge it open. And so now that gives us the space, if you can see here, to make our flare connections. And then this wire will be run up and in. We'll open this front panel when it's time to make the electrical connections. And then the last connection that we'll be doing is the drain line connection here. So this, these two pieces go together. All right, so I'm just applying some of our refrigerant line sealer or sealant. I don't know what you would call that. And then we'll be getting our flared connections going. Again, when you're doing these flared connections, you don't need to get them super crazy tight. In fact, your real only goal is to get them tight enough so that the copper, which is soft, kind of just flattens out and forms a nice seal around the male end of the connection. If you go too tight, you risk potentially kinking the line or causing that copper to thin out too thin and you're gonna have a weak connection.
So now that we have our refrigerant lines hooked up, we're gonna go ahead and connect our vacuum pump, pull a vacuum, and make sure that we don't have any leaks in the system. Additionally, pulling a vacuum will evacuate all of the atmospheric air in our line set, and when we drop the pressure inside the lines, any moisture that's residual in the air or lines will actually boil off and get pumped out. We've got our vacuum pump here connected to our gauge set. Our gauge set is connected to the service port here. That's the top port on the unit. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and turn on our vacuum pump. We're gonna open our valve. And what we wanna see is a full vacuum being pulled on the system. And because we're at altitude, a full vacuum is actually gonna read a little bit less than it would at sea level, but that's not a problem at all. We're gonna leave this on for about 20 minutes, and then we'll let it sit for about another 10 to 15 minutes. And as long as we don't lose any vacuum, then we're good to go and move on to the next section in the test. We ran our vacuum pump, we shut it off, we closed the valve first, and we shut it off, and time has elapsed and we're still holding a vacuum. So that means we can move on to the next phase of the test, which is to release some refrigerant into the system and apply pressure. And we'll look and we, sh we should see that gauge um, move up. And once there's some in there, we'll let that sit for a few more minutes. And if it doesn't lose pressure, then we're good to go release everything and power it on. So, so there we go. We let some in and let's just take a note of where we're sitting at. It looks like, we'll call it 15 on the outer gauge there on the PSI. Come back in about five minutes. If that is in the same location, we can release the rest of the pressure, power it on and start cooling down. Okay, while our vacuum pump is hard at work dropping the pressure on our system, it's a great time to go ahead and finish the electrical wiring on the interior unit. So to gain access to this, if you reach around the sides, you just pop that open and you lift this up, and just like the hood of a car, it's got a catch on there. This cover, you remove that screw, and you can pop this cover off. And I went ahead and put our um, wires through the back of the machine. There's a hole back there. And just like we did on the outside, we're gonna connect wires one, two, and three that are labeled to these ports. The ground goes there. There's a strain relief clamp that we will insert here like that and tighten down. And then if your unit came with the Wi-Fi option for being connected to the internet, that's actually on this model gonna plug in right here. So we'll go ahead and stick that in. And then once all of our connections are made, we'll close this down and then we'll probably be just in time to go shut off the vacuum pump and make sure that that system doesn't pick up any pressure. All right, I'm taking a peek at our gauge and it, it has not moved at all. We are good to go ahead and release the rest of the refrigerant into the system and then we'll go ahead and open the lower valve here. And then before we wrap things up on the outside, we're gonna go ahead and put these caps back on the service ports here. So this cap and then the cap above it. Release the rest of this and then just unscrew it until it bottoms out. We just wanna make sure the valve is completely open. And then the last step is just put the caps back on. All right, well our time outside has come to an end and not too soon if you ask me. The last bit relating to the install that we need to take care of, if you recall, we've got these refrigerant lines just going through a big hole here. The kit comes with this stuff called plasticine. It's basically clay, but essentially we're just gonna tap into our inner child and pack this very tightly all around these lines and get a nice airtight and watertight seal. And there we go, look at that. Beautiful. We know all of our refrigerant lines are good. The last connection to make in here is gonna be our drain. And so we got a little slack here. Now, just like with any drain, the most important thing is to make sure it's going downhill at all times. We don't want any kinks. We don't want any traps, anything like that that's gonna cause a problem. So it's pretty simple. We just stick it together and we push it in until it clicks into place. I'm just gonna go ahead and pull this through and there's that insulation I was talking about earlier that I rerouted or that I trimmed back. We're gonna put that back into place. Make sure our drain is running downhill and it is and there's a little cavity in here that all this tucks into out of the way and then it just clips down like that. Make sure that's going out our hole still. 
So the next thing we're gonna do is power on the breaker. It should beep. Boom. And we can go ahead and turn it on. And let's just cool this puppy down, shall we? Real quick, I'll just talk about this remote control. It's got all of your settings here, mode, all of that. This also functions as a heater and a dehumidifier. One of the more useful modes that it has. So turbo will get it cooled down as fast as possible using as much energy as possible. Eco is the opposite of that, as you can imagine. The I feel button, what it does is instead of relying on the unit here to be the thermostat temperature sensor, it actually relies on what the remote is sensing. If you are gonna be in the front of the bus, but the unit is back here, you can take this with you to the front and the unit will cool off and behave in accordance with keeping the front cool where the remote is. And right now, I guess we'll start this test. So it is a uh, balmy 93 in here. I think we'll go ahead and close these windows maybe and we'll see how we do. One of the reasons that Brock decided to go with the mini split for his bus is because it is by far and away the most efficient way to heat and cool your bus using electricity. That opens up the possibility of you powering that off of solar. And so that's Brock's end game. And I'm gonna talk just real quick about some upgrades that we're doing while we're in here to make Brock's bus capable to run that off grid. And hopefully it'll inspire you and give you some information so that if you want to do this system for the same reasons, you'll have a rough idea of what you're in store for. And if you want some help, feel free to reach out to me. I'm a dealer for a lot of these products. I'm happy to design systems for you to run your off grid mini split. So the first place that we're starting with is with the inverter on Brock's bus. Now Brock's bus already had some high quality equipment in there, it was Victron equipment, but his inverter was only a 2000 watt unit. I like to, if you're gonna be using a mini split, have at minimum 3000 watts available. So we're upgrading to this Victron Multi Plus 3000. That means that when the inverter is running and really using juice, you know, around 1200 to 1500 watts at most, he still has headroom to run his other AC devices, which with the current 2000 watt unit he has, he really would be pushing it. And there's the chance that if he turned on another appliance, it would kick the inverter into an overload situation. The other thing that we're upgrading for Brock is we're putting in a bigger battery bank. So he's been using a conventional lead acid based battery and those are fine. But when you get into high draw, high use devices, you really wanna consider switching over to lithium. So we're doing some lithium iron phosphate server rack batteries. These batteries have a cycle life of four to 6,000 cycles, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 years of daily complete use, like 100% to 0%. The nice thing about these batteries, in addition to being pretty affordable for what they offer, we've got 5.1 kilowatt hours of energy storage in each unit, and he's got three. That mini split when it's operating will pull around a thousand watts in cooling mode generally so if that thing's on high and it's cooling each one of these batteries gets him close to four and a half hours of runtime and he's going to have three of them so that means if there's no sun and no power incoming into his system he'll still be able to run his mini split for about 12 hours this is about the same size that I recommend to just about anybody who's doing the same thing Brock is as a bare minimum to get a lot of functionality. Now, of course, if you have the money and the space, by all means, buy some more batteries, why not? But this is a great start. And for what Brock uses that rig for, I think this is the perfect size. The last upgrade that we're doing is we are installing a high capacity DC to DC charger. This will allow Brock to charge his 24 volt battery based system off of his 12 volt bus electrical alternator. And it will regulate that charging and the parameters are programmable so that we can make sure that this charger charges these lithium batteries exactly the way they want to be charged. If you want help with this, this is a service that is a specialty of mine. I'm happy to consult with you and I can sell you this equipment, save you some money and get you a system that I can promise will meet your needs and work for you. So let's get back in and see if we can cool that bus off. I think it definitely works. We've already dropped 20 degrees, 73 in here. I'm ready for a pumpkin spice latte. If it's not obvious, I think the install is a success. No more hot days. All right, well that wraps up three days of 
hard work, but we weren't working too hard, were we? We took breaks. We took breaks. For those of you at home who are considering doing a mini split install either on your bus or even at your house, a lot of this is still applicable. The people at Pioneer and me and Brock want you to feel like this is something you can take on with not a whole lot of extra tools and you don't need to be super smart i mean we can do it so thanks for watching this far brock how are you feeling about your new mini split setup on your bus i'm mostly interested to see how it controls the climate of the bus while yeah. we're traveling you know now yeah. that we're like kids and animals and we're all traveling together it's yeah. kind of important to keep the inside nice and Cool. Totally. So we are reaching, you know, the end of the summer, mm -hmm. um, but we have maybe a month or two more of like warm weather. So um, put it to the test to see how it does. Yeah. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for our backyard install of the Pioneer Mini Split on my friend Brock's bus. Brock, thank you for hosting us. Yeah. And Pioneer, thank you for hooking us up with the equipment so that we could show all of you fine folks how it's done. Enjoy staying cool. Charlie's probably not going to talk about it, so I'm oh. going to talk about it real yeah. quick. So the, another reason behind this video is because Charlie is doing consulting. And when he started talking about how he wanted to do this <laughs> when the shop is closing down, I was like, hey, I have a project for you if you want to <laughs> test this out. So this was our first uh, try at it. Yeah. Um, and it was great. Obviously, he's my friend. I'm going to speak nothing but highly of him. but. Uh, he is the best in the bus world, in my opinion. So if you need anything as far as consulting wise, <laughs> especially solar um, and power banks, reach out to this guy. Uh, you, what's Brock. the best way for people to get a hold of you? Well, my company is called Chrome Yellow and you can find us at chromeyellowcorp.com. And of course, my YouTube channel, Chuck Cassidy, that has every way you could possibly want to get a hold of me there. So yeah, and you, don't, Brock. don't spell Chuck Cassidy wrong like I have done multiple times. Yeah. And Brock runs Bus Life Adventure. If you're interested in bus life, you gotta go there. It's a one-stop shop. He's been doing it as long as I have. If you can't tell, we're getting a long in the tooth. But uh, I think that's gonna do it. Thanks again, yeah. Brock. Thank you, Pioneer, and thank you for watching. Can we hug on film? Is that yeah, okay, okay. all right. <laughs> all right.